About a month ago, I posted I was going to restore an old fifth generation iPod. Some questioned why I would bother, whereas many others were supportive. There is a long and short version of what happened. For those who have ADHD and simply cannot sit still and listen for more than six minutes at a time, here is the short version. Learn to sit still for more than six minutes. For everyone else who can control their impulses, let's talk iPod fever. When I say iPod fever, I mean it. I have several times thought about getting a new old stock iPod or a refurbished iPod or a broken iPod to fix. And each time I checked on eBay, the prices for iPods were simply ridiculous. For the price of one used iPod, you could easily buy a modern Fio DAP. And for the price of buying an old iPod and new parts to refurbish it, you could just buy yourself a DAP that plays all major audio formats. So why buy an iPod in 2020? It's the DAC. We all know that's true. The original iPod made sound happen. The DAC wasn't anything really special. Subsequent releases got better with greater amplification and used better DAC chips. This culminated in the iPod 5th generation, widely recognized as the iPod with the best DAC. Both the 5th and 5.5 generation iPods use the same DAC, the Wolfson WM87588G. Mm, just rolls off the tongue. Back when iPods mattered, a lot of MP3 players had harsh, brittle, tinny sound quality. They were downright awful. The Wolfson DAX in the 5th generation iPod provided a more natural tonality. It had a slight bass emphasis with natural decay, clear mids, and a rolled off treble that retained airiness without becoming harsh. Subsequent iPods switched to Cirrus Logic DAX, and we all know how harsh these DAX tend to be. But why bother in 2020? Why spend money on an outdated, practically ancient music player with limited functionality? Well, as I said, it's the DAC. I have said many times on my channel that older DAC chipsets have a musical quality that modern DACs simply do not. And the reason is simple. Modern DACs from AKM, Cirrus Logic, and ESS Sabre are competing with each other for the most neutral sound signature, which is continually resulting in unnatural tonality and harshness. What Wolfson achieved in the older DACs was a sound signature that appealed to both audiophile and casual listener. And I am a proponent of using older gear rather than constantly buying the next hyped product. If sound quality is all you care about, then you should not disregard products like the iPod. Audiophiles who have been through the hype machine know this to be true. That's why iPods still cost far too much money for being so old and useless in the modern world. I bought my iPod because I wanted to keep a piece of audio history iPods changed how I listened to my favorite artists. iPods changed the music industry. I collect older DAPs and DACs. I do it partly out of nostalgia, but I also do it because I crave that old musical experience. And of course, items like the KNI5, Calyx M, Cowan P1, and Opus No. 2 are hard to find iPods may never totally disappear since China manufactures every single part you could possibly need to build your own iPod. Other than the logic board, Chinese merchants sell brand new iPod parts from screws to frames to LCD screens. But you never know. Maybe one day iPods will simply turn into one of those other players I mentioned, difficult to find and lost in memory. My goal with an iPod was to upgrade to a higher capacity battery, use an iFlash mod to add an SD card for storage, and possibly find a portable amplifier to pair with the iPod. Now, the portable amplifier I found months ago. It is the ATC P2. I researched which iPod to buy, the 3rd, 4th, or 5th gen. The consensus was that the 5th gen was the best, but some claim that the slight update to the 5th gen, commonly called the iPod 5.5, had the best sound quality. The iPod 5.5 is very expensive. They are on eBay, but sellers demand hundreds of dollars for original iPods. Since I was fairly certain I would screw up the modification, I did not want to spend a lot of money on my iPod. Consequently, I bought a $60 refurbished iPod 5th generation. This iPod had a new battery and the seller claimed everything worked. The iPod had a 30GB hard drive. 
I then bought an iFlash adapter for about $40. I already had plenty of SD cards at home, so that wasn't an expense. I decided to buy a $5 battery since it came with tools to open the iPod. This provided me the necessary tools at the cheapest possible price, something that I would come to regret. All in all, my iPod upgrade gear cost just over $100. I watched several YouTube videos showing how to open an iPod. The procedure does require you to bend the metal back piece, and often it causes some stress and damage, especially if your iPod is in bad shape to begin with. Opening an iPod requires patience more than anything else. Once inside, the iPod is fairly simple. The battery is attached to the back cover, the 3.5mm port has a ribbon cable attached to the logic board, and the LCD screen is safely nestled above the logic board itself. Taking the hard drive out is a simple matter. Putting the iFlash adapter in is also straightforward. The problem arises really with the SD card. iFlash adapters are finicky. Some SD cards will never work. Others reportedly work but still may not. The best thing to do is to format and reformat and reformat and <laughs> reformat the SD card before you put it into the iPod. You have to make sure it is in FAT32 format. You have to erase and do it again and again. Trust me, formatting my SD card once was not enough. It took repeated tries, and I simply don't know why. In fact, forum posts said this is really kind of par for the course. Once you put the SD card into the iPod, do yourself a favor and don't close it up. Instead, plug the iPod into your computer to make sure everything works. At this point, you might be wondering if Apple still supports iPod. Well, iTunes does. Download iTunes from Apple's website, plug in your iPod, and you'll get a prompt saying iTunes needs to install legacy drivers to recognize the iPod. And it's that simple. That's what I did. And amazingly, iTunes recognized my modified iPod. Transferring audio files was the next problem. I have nearly 70 gigabytes of select FLAC music. I didn't want to convert it all to MP3 or some other format. The issue is that Apple never allowed FLAC on iPods. I found a paid application called Walter, W-A-L-T-R, that claimed it would transfer FLAC to the iPod and the iPod would play it. I tested this. The program did in fact transfer all my FLAC music to the iPod, and it appeared to play just fine. I thought this would be the end, so I closed the iPod and happily went for a long walk. I tell you, I was in audio nirvana, listening to my iPod on my IEMs. No, the iPod didn't sound magical and it didn't blow my mind, but it was a nice trip back into my past. I remembered all the times I would lay in bed late at night and listen to my albums over and over again. I couldn't put my iPod down. I listened for hours. I took it with me to my friend's house for a family dinner. I showed it off to everyone I could. People were confused why I had this silly thing, but the smile on my face stayed all day. Then, my iPod started to die. I don't know what it was, but the following day, the iPod started skipping songs. I couldn't play anything. It didn't matter which tracks I selected, the iPod simply wouldn't play them. I researched online for a solution, but couldn't find anything. So I opened the iPod again and took out the SD card and reformatted it. <laughs> Who knows how many times I did that. I put it back into my iPod and transferred my songs onto it again. And everything seemed fine. But to be absolutely sure, I reformatted the SD card once more. I then converted my entire FLAC library to Apple Lossless. I then transferred the converted music to the iPod, and it seemed to work. So I closed the iPod. Then the iPod randomly shut down several times afterwards. I restarted it and tried to play music, but it wouldn't play. It kept skipping tracks. So I opened the iPod yet again and took out the SD card. I went to the iFlash website and noticed that some had complained the SanDisk SD card I was using might not work. I mean, it was officially supported, but some had complained that it just didn't work for them. Unfortunately, this particular card is all that I had. I used these cards for my cameras, and frankly, they were great. I then hunted for another card. I finally cannibalized an SD card from one of my modern DAPs. This card was not on the list of SD cards on the iFlash website, but since I had nothing else on hand, I went ahead and formatted this card anyway and went through the same process all over again. And you guessed it, 
again. The iPod simply wouldn't work. It kept skipping songs. So then I switched to Rockbox, and when I tried to play from Rockbox, it simply wouldn't recognize the files I had transferred over. Strangely enough, every time I tried to transfer songs directly to the iPod's SD card in Rockbox mode, the transfer would stop after a few minutes, and this got frustrating really fast. I was then forced to open the iPod yet again. Is anybody keeping count how many times this happened? And well, it was apparently one too many times because the iPod started to break. The back cover warped, the battery cable ribbon snapped off at the logic board connection, the plastic internal frame started to break apart. 24 hours after I had successfully modified my iPod, it was officially dead. I was very disappointed to say the least. But I was going to modify an iPod, damn it, whether someone liked it or not. So I asked my friend if I could borrow her 5th generation iPod that was sitting in her garage. She said yes, but of course she had a condition. She wanted me to upgrade her iPod and give it back to her. Hmm, pretty cheeky. Well, I had plenty of spare iPod parts at this point, and it made no sense to throw them out if I could actually use them. So. I took my friend's iPod, carefully opened it, replaced the old battery with a high capacity battery from the iPod I had purchased, I took out the hard drive and put in the iFlash card that was useless in my iPod, I put in the SanDisk SD card that wouldn't work with my iPod into my friend's iPod. I mean, hey, if it didn't work for mine, then I wanted to see if it worked for hers. I went through the exact same steps with her iPod that I had done with mine. And lo and behold, hers worked, and kept working, and kept working. I gave her back her modified iPod and told her to keep using it. I expected her to call me the next day complaining it had died. And a part of me really wanted that. A small yet growing part of me wanted her iPod to die just like mine had. She called the next day. I asked her about the iPod. She said it was working just like new. Just my luck. A week went by and I asked her again and she said she had transferred all her old music to the iPod and was enjoying it immensely. Some part of me was happy for her, but most of me was pretty sad. What I learned from this experience is that if you're going to modify an iPod, make sure you have two. The thing is, I have no idea why my iPod wouldn't work. It could have been the logic board, or the ribbon cable attached to the iFlash card, or the battery, or a short somewhere, who knows. Well, I wanted my iPod, so I went back online and I found an iPod 5.5. The seller had taken the guts out and put them inside the case of a 7th generation iPod. The seller had already upgraded the battery and added the iFlash adapter with an approved SD card. I did my due diligence and once satisfied, I bought the iPod. The seller shipped it a few days later, and he used the slowest, possible shipping method. He literally could have driven the iPod to be faster. Instead, my second iPod took nearly three weeks to arrive from less than 1,500 miles away from within the United States. <laughs> Boy, this experience keeps getting better and better. I plugged in this second iPod once I finally got it, and iTunes immediately recognized it. I transferred my Apple lossless files. It took nearly two hours. Once done, I went out for a long walk, and the iPod worked. And it kept working. Thankfully, this second iPod functioned as the first one was supposed to have. The iPod has sufficient amplification for IEMs and some headphones. For example, the Maisie 99 Classics gets plenty of power at 50% volume. But I wanted to use my ATC amplifier, so I bought a third-party 30-pin to 3.5mm line-out adapter. I plugged it in and then connected the iPod to the ATC. I plugged in my Maze 99 into the ATC and started to play tracks. I was immediately disappointed. The line-out adapter method resulted in awful sound quality. The sound lacked amplification, had a flat sound signature, no dynamics, and was overall muddy and noisy. I plugged my headphones directly into the iPods and the difference was immediate. I did some research, and apparently the line-out adapter is not really at fault. The 30-pin line-out function is notoriously bad. There is a small company in England that sells refurbished iPods, and adapts the 30-pin line-out to fix this issue. 
Unfortunately, their modified iPods cost nearly $400. The second issue I found is that when I converted my FLAC files to Apple Lossless, a lot of metadata did not get transferred. Now, I used FUBAR to do the conversion. I expected FUBAR to convert without issues. Well, it converts fine. The audio plays on the iPod, but the album art for many of my tracks is not correct. The third issue I found is that iTunes would not transfer about 100 of my Apple Lossless tracks to the iPod. It gave me an error message without actually explaining why it wasn't going to send those tracks over to the iPod. Are there fixes for these issues? For the line out problem, no, there is no direct fix for the 30 pin output. But you can just use the headphone jack to the ATC. I did that and was pleasantly surprised to hear a very dynamic sound signature. With my Maze 99, I could not hear any noise or distortion in this setup. As for the album art issue, it is possible that some setting in FUBAR might fix this. The iTunes problem is something I cannot fix. I have no idea what the issue is, but there is a workaround. I was able to transfer all of my music using the Walter application. I tried both the Apple Lossless library and my FLAC library. Both transferred without problems. So, after spending more money than I wanted to, what did I learn? Actually, a lot. First, if you want an iPod to modify, just buy a modified iPod. It will save you a lot of time and frustration. You'll end up spending about the same amount of money for a modified iPod with an SD card as you would for an iPod plus iFlash adapter plus SD card plus new battery plus tools. Second, be very careful who you purchase from on eBay. There are several sellers who claim to have either brand new and sealed iPods or iPods in like new condition, but these people are selling these iPods at a stupid low price. Nobody in their right mind would sell a brand new iPod 5th generation for $60. I contacted these sellers to find out what the deal was, and they never responded. Hint, hint. Third, you have to be content with the iPod's limitations. The iPod's amplifier is nothing special. Searching for songs is either impossible or, as in the case of the iPod 5.5, very cumbersome. The user interface and navigation are pretty easy, but there is still a delay in responding to input when playing songs. Moreover, the iPod benefits from a portable amplifier. You see, although I very much enjoyed listening to the Maze 99 through the iPod, the experience was intoxicating with the ATC amp, and this is because the amplifier properly drove the drivers in the Maze A99. Fourth, the modification takes something away from the iPod experience. Part of the nostalgia of the iPod is the fit, finish, and feel. Those old clunky hard drives in the iPods added weight, which then made the iPod feel much more substantial and premium. With the hard drive swapped out for an SD card, the iPod feels like a toy. This isn't a big deal, but it is worth keeping in mind. The reality distortion field around your iPod nostalgia won't be perfect. Finally, I learned this was a pretty fun experience, despite all the frustration and waiting. It was entertaining to read forums about the iPod and people's suggestions on how to modify it. It was even nice to try out Rockbox. I wish I had bought a modified iPod to begin with, but the experience I gained was still a net positive. I have a strong desire to buy iPod parts separately and make my own iPod. And one day, if I can find a cheap modified iPod from England, I'd like to give that a try too. Overall, I am quite happy with my iPod journey. The sound quality out of the iPod is nothing magical, of course, as I said. I did not have a wild belief that the iPod would put my modern DAPs to shame, and that certainly is not the case. But there is a noticeable difference between the iPod and, say, the Shanling Q1 or the Hibby R3 Pro or the Sony NWA55 or even the Con Cube. The iPod provides a slightly warmer sound signature than any of these modern DAPs. The biggest difference, at least to me, is the presentation of vocals. The Wolfson DAC in the iPod provides not a smooth sense of vocal, but one with a natural tonality. I'll give you an example. Look up the artist Guy Clark on YouTube. He is a legend, but now dead. Listen to a few of his songs. You should notice that he has a gruff voice, full of depth, pitch, and nuance. Sometimes his voice sounds a little scratchy, but it is always deep. The Wolfson Dak in the iPod brings this unique voice to the forefront. 
the warmth of the iPod sound just complements Guy Clark's songs. Pianos also sound exceptionally natural. There is a hint of bass reverberation in Flight from the City by Johan Johansson. Nothing sounds accentuated, nothing sounds distorted. Of course, the iPod is not neutral. It does not provide details like some reference class DAPs. It does not have the smooth tonality of Shanling or some Astle and Kern players. To some, the difference will be minor depending on their headphones and music. To others, the iPod won't be their cup of tea. But the point I'm trying to make is that the constant DAP upgrade nonsense is just a scam. You can be confident knowing that when you buy a Fio or Shanling or Astral and Kern or Sony player this year, you will see an upgraded version the next. What was marketed as flagship and best in show last year is now not good enough, at least according to the manufacturers and reviewers. Those who are more interested in finding the perfect sound for them might want to consider a modified iPod. Those who have never heard one of these old iPods might be surprised by the quality. Look, it's not for everyone. In fact, it's not for most people. It's not really cheap, and it's pretty frustrating. You get more bang for your dollar with Theo and Shanling DAPs. But if you have the time, patience, money, and passion, getting an iPod can be rather fulfilling. And it doesn't hurt to use the iPod and compare it to every new hyped product. <laughs>